Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with visual aids about statistics. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I'm a statistician here aboard a boat in the Pacific Ocean. I'm trying to count fish, but every time I get above seven, I lose track and grumble about how this is the work of a computer. Not for me. Having an argument with a sailor about how far 20,000 leagues under the sea is, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I have not written a bit to go at the start of the podcast st statistically insignificant. You're letting the side down. <laughs> <laughs> I do all this work. I ask one thing of you. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a guest staring down some eldritch creature from the deep. It's fish biologist and researcher at University of California, Santa Cruz, Jesse Black. How's it going, Jesse? Hey, going great. That's good. Uh, I also use also use he him. Uh, also doing great. Fantastic. Um, thinking about Eldritch stuff over here. <laughs> <laughs> As you might imagine, we have another ocean-based episode today. I consider this our podcasting duty to present both sides of ocean science, oceanographers and fish people. This time, we're talking about how one estimates fish population sizes. But first, Jesse, what the fuck is a fish? I wish we knew. I wish we knew. But, I mean, I'm just kidding. There's actually a pretty specific definition, but um, I think it's a broader definition than a lot of people might realize. Uh, so I'm just going to go with the the full Wikipedia definition. Are you ready? Oh, go on. This is dense. Fish are aquatic, craniate, gill-bearing animals that lack limbs with digits. But what okay, about the hagfish? Say, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they have to be aquatic. They have to be craniate, meaning they have a cranium. So like, you know, kind of head, something gesturing towards a head, usually. Okay, so starfish um, are not fish. Correct. Okay. Starfish, not fish. Um, they are echinoderms, which is a strange word. It's closer to a uh, like a sea cucumber. I live in Australia, so I am familiar with the kidnas. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> wait, those aren't the ones that can kill you. Those are the ones that lay eggs. I mean, the, there are some that lay eggs that can also kill you. Let's be clear oh, about Jesus. that one. Okay. Yeah, but the, the kidnas yeah. are friendly little spiky guys, kind of like a hedgehog, but more arid. Oh, and more marsupial. <sighs> they, are they monotremes as well? Yeah, they are. The, the they're lay, one of the monotremes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Very cool. We have a couple of those. But yeah, so starfish, not a fish. Uh, but you know what is a fish? A hagfish. Are you familiar with hagfish? They're the, like, they look like eels, don't they? They're like Yes, finless... eels also fish. Okay, so that what I think of with hagfish is copious amounts of goop and yes. like a circular tooth system. Absolutely, absolutely right. They basically like rasp uh, flesh off of usually dead prey. Um by like tying themselves into like knots for leverage and torque. It's disgusting, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so they, they're fish that you, are into really intense shibari. They, yeah, they literally <laughs> will tie. You can, you can, if you want to, uh, YouTube um, hagfish tying themselves into knots. Uh, hagfish creating a bucket full of mucus. So if you chuck a hagfish in like a paint bucket full of water, I believe it like all, almost all of it congeals into like a mucusy sort of situation. Um, but I'm guessing they used to like get away, you know. So nothing really wants to eat hagfish. I'm assuming for most. Well, no, reasons. I can imagine like that would yeah. surely fuck up your gills. Like if yeah, you're you try to eat guess. that. Yeah, you don't want the, any any goo, uh, un unwanted goo in your mm. gills. Now I don't know anything about science, but I have read Moby Dick, <laughs> and in it, Melville <laughs> confidently states that the whale is a fish. Dang, <laughs> this seems uh, unlikely to be true. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> you know, it's, has anyone I'm assuming nobody told him I mean well, I don't know had they worked out that taxonomy back oh, then oh that's a great question when was that written 19th century the 19th century I feel like somebody probably knew <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know enough about like evolutionary history of fishes in, in is what did they know when did they know a whale wasn't a fish it's a great question well I mean I guess the question there is which cate which criteria does it fail it, oh, gills, right? It wouldn't doesn't yes, have gills, correct. right? Okay. Well, it's interesting thing about the whale is all you know, um, cetaceans like that and dolphins, they have evolved from mammals that lived on land, which in the mammals that lived on land also evolved from at some point a fish. So in the evolutionary history, you have things evolving. Finally, we get to fish. Some of the fish evolve further. They evolve so that they can go on land. That's very cool. Um, and some of those guys that figured out how to go on land eventually evolved back to go into the water 
And that is your whales and porpoises <laughs> and stuff like that. Belugas, dolphins. I, I firmly um, believe they got out, they went, hey, this sucks, and decided to go back in. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like, actually, this sucks really bad. We're going to go back inside. Um, yeah. It's just funny to think about, like, the great, 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 great times whatever million grandparent of a beluga is, like, a weird kind of rat-looking thing. <laughs> it's very strange. Look, whomst among us does not have rat in their ancestry, so. I mean, none of us don't. <laughs> They're just fun little guys. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So if those are what fish are, what fishes are, I don't know. What how, What's the plural Ooh, do situation? Do you want to know there? the official? Oh, do you want to know the yes. lowdown on that? Yeah, yeah there's yeah. an actual answer. I asked my advisor this. It's like the one first thing I asked him in grad school. It's like, what's, <laughs> what's going on here? So when you say there are many fish in a pool or something, there's that means there's just a lot of, like, there's a lot of fish in there. If you were saying... If you're specifying the difference between multiple types of fish, as in the Chinook salmon and the green sturgeon, those are two s- separate fishes. Like, among fishes implies types among different types of fish. Um, right. The fish is like kind of a, I don't know the term for this, but it's like um, a simpler it's a, plural. Yeah, look, my linguistics is a dark past that I don't touch on very much, and I wasn't very good at grammar anyway. But uh, it seems... <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, I'm an expert in the language that I speak, which is bad Australian, right. and that's all I need. <laughs> Linguists don't don't write it in to correct me on that. <laughs> well, look, if or they do. if they write it with or corrections, do. if they're not about the statistics, they just get quietly shuffled off. <laughs> so it goes right to a different folder. <laughs> yes, the bin. Nah, write that's... them to me on Twitter. I want to get into some fights. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that is kind of your thing. So you, you, you can have the grammatical complaints and I'll deal with the numerical ones. It'll be oh. fine. <laughs> if we have all of these different fish and fish adjacent, because I guess they're not the only mm. thing in the ocean, why do we want to estimate fish populations? It's a great question. So I think there's multiple interacting reasons to be interested in this. First thing is like, you know, it's always... It's you know sometimes you're just curious how many fish are in a lake near you. That's a perfectly cool thing to wonder and want to know the answer to for just curiosity's sake. Love that. It's great. Don't want to over understate that. Um, also, okay, so think about when we build as we start to build out civilization. We have impacts on the environment around us. Um, and inevitably, a lot of things lead to the sea in terms of runoff, pollution. You know, us actually. Of rerouting water, us ruining water in other ways. Uh, we want to know what our impacts are on fish in, you know, our lakes, rivers, and oceans. And that's not even just for. You could you could frame it purely in economic reasons. We is you know people defend, sorry, depend on the fish uh, markets to make a living. Uh, people depend on them uh, for food. There are some populations on Earth that like really heavily depend on seafood particularly some indigenous populations. And so there's, there's, you have this economic benefit of knowing uh, how much is in a lake and river. And that's the kind that gets tossed around in terms of regulations um, and regulatory frameworks in the government. But you also have like, you know, the, the clear reason that people need to eat and people often rely on fish to eat them. Um, so there's no, I think that's a good summation of a lot of the reasons. Another reason we might not think about is, is just knowing how much, how many fish and how many fish is, as in how many fish period are in, you know, say, a local lake, but also the diversity in terms of fishes. Like, how is the ecosystem doing? How many types of fish are there? Are they growing in number? Are they growing in size? Are they shrinking in size? Are they shrinking in number? Are there, is one type of them dominating versus another type, another species? Um, is there a reason for that? Uh, are we causing any un- instability or change uh, that we can kind of attribute? To maybe we're on a broad level uh, increasing the temperature in terms of climate change or uh, building dams that might reroute water. Um, so we, we want to know how, my, how many fish are around us because, you know, we need them. And they, mm. for better or for worse, depend on us yeah. <laughs> in terms of like what we are doing. I would say maybe instead of depend on us, they are beholden to our fuck Exactly, offs. yes. That's, that's kind of what I, yeah. <laughs> It's exactly what the kind of the tone I'm <laughs> going for <laughs> too. Yeah. Oh, introduced species is a huge, huge aspect of knowing what's going on, especially as you know, commercial travel, commercial shipping has just changed the way species move on a global level that I mean, this just not really happened before, obviously. 
Okay, so I, I have a somewhat sideways question on that front. How does introduced species work with connected ocean areas? Like, how do you define something as an introduced species if you have all these different seas and oceans and things that are connected? Yeah. I, I guess there aren't the kind of barriers that you get between land masses that make something quite clear, clearly an introduced species. Great question. So I think a lot of the sort of... What you're getting at is like the... the the habitat is absolutely like continuous in that it's just you know solid water from one end to the other. Yeah. Um, but there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of depth, mm. um, temperature, environmental aspects. Also consider that when you think of just the oceans, the big, the big ocean, capital O ocean, most of that is like abyssal plain. We call it is in the depth is like five thousand meters down, and it's just a big desert and it's open ocean. There's no cover. There's nowhere to hide. Um, right, so you don't actually... So what I'm hearing is that uh, Blue Planet and similar have in fact lied to me when they indicated <laughs> that there were these huge schools of fish just kind of hanging out in mid-ocean. Oh, they totally do do that, because but they are populations of fish and species that are adapted to live that way. Like It's akin to almost like species that are really good at living in deserts because mm. you're dealing with a huge, um, I guess you could call it flat area, not a lot of cover in terms of visual cover besides gradients and light with depth, right? Um, not a lot of food concentrations, and you have end up having to go long distances for food or or be very fast to catch up with things. Mm. And contrast that with uh, a lot of fish on Earth can't live out there because they are associated with much shallower habitats where they rely on things like cover and rocks and mud and different flows and uh, some different salinities even will mess with their chem chemistry. Well so... How how much of yeah, that like stuff that's living close to shore also relies on like land runoff? Yes, okay. heavily. It, well, yes, it's it, um, it's all connected uh, like from the land into the rivers, into the lakes, into the streams, into the ocean. In even just like a nutrient sense, like mm. the runoff will get kind of feed, if you will, like a lot of the microbial activity downstream. Um, and if that gets out of whack from say like dumping a bunch of fertilizer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It can really blow up things in water chemistry in a big way. Like, imagine if, like, we breathed in air that also had, like, all of our food just kind of floating in it at all times. Like, it's just bizarre. To think I have about. seen people eat in a way I would describe as inhaling, but it is a little <laughs> different. <to> that, yes. <laughs> like, having no control over, you know, the fluid. And this is true to extend we live in like a gaseous atmosphere. But in the ocean, it's truly, like, pollution is so brutal because it's, like, living in it and some things have really tight ranges and they can't exactly just swim mm. to a whole new habitat because there's might be barriers to movement um that you might not expect just based on habitats climate um, topography even under the water yeah well i do know that um so i live in sydney and south of sydney is a place called wollongong and Wollongong has a uh, history of heavy industry. Uh, so there's a steel mill. There was a copper smelter as well. Oh, no. There is shitloads of heavy metal pollution in all the coastal areas around those. It's less than it used to be, but arsenic doesn't go away. You no, know? it's brutal. Yeah. So uh, don't eat anything from that area of Wollongong out of the ocean. Just don't do it. Go somewhere else. Mercury's probably off the charts. Oh, I look, guess, arsenic, didn't... cadmium, mercury, lead. The the whole gamut is there, yeah, for sure. The heavy metals is, like, one of the most depressing things to happen to river streams, etc. Yeah. Gosh, Keep it, it in the concerts there. where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm a heavy metal fan. But yeah, me too. Not that kind. Not in my rivers. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. There are pl appropriate places for this. Time and place. Time and yeah, place. Yeah. See, as a punk rock fan, I'm uh, looking down on you guys. <laughs> Endorsing heavy metal at it all. It's much higher life experience. <laughs> than so when it comes to like talking about fish populations and fish management and things, you sent me this picture. Would you like to tell me about this picture? Yeah, so that's um, a lot of what I kind of the more recent modern western efforts to quote like manage we call it managing a fishery which is basically like uh, keeping track of it making sure that humans aren't taking too many making sure that the a population of fish is doing fine and it's not like crashing or um you know some other mysterious uh, invading invasive species isn't taking over that's like kind of the modern method of management is talking about 
you know, how do we track these fish and make sure uh, there's, you know, a maximum sustainable yield uh, is a term that gets bandied about. So it's very much kind of a data-driven model for fish management. Yes. And this, what I'm showing you the picture here is just a, um, so this, what I'm talking about is, is kind of more the more Western-based modern, but people have been doing this for a long period of time when we talk about managing fisheries. So this is like a Hawaiian uh, fish pond. It's actually a really cool it's a bit of fisheries management that um, the Hawaiians have been doing for like thousands of years where you have this big uh, kind of ring formed with coral and rock um, that people would build up that enclosed a little bay of water off the side of the ocean. And there was these sluice gates. So you see this like wooden slatted gate. This thing. And it's just, yeah, it's just, it was designed to be just small enough so that juvenile fish, um, e fry and larvae even, can kind of flow in and out and get trapped in there as they fatten up and get bigger. Okay. And so eventually, yeah. So uh, uh, like, as in quite literally the gaps between these posts yes. are big enough for small f- for the small fish and fish fry. Precisely. Okay. Uh, so yeah, totally. like, I imagine, I can't quite see, but it looks like it might be a case of like, there's a block kind of at this height. So maybe at high tide stuff comes over and then at low tide it goes back mm-hmm. out. Okay. Yeah. So you end up getting just a bit of a, uh, you're kind of in, in a lot of these juveniles can it move independently as they start growing and to be a, like kind of motile on their own. Um, but essentially you'll trap a bunch of little fish in this little enclosed area. Um, it's actually quite large. It looks like you know, a couple high one at least is a few like football fields at least. Mm. Uh, but then eventually the fish just kind of keep eating and eating and rearing and getting big enough that they can't leave. And then, you know, you've got a readily available population of fish that you can pretty easily look at. Um, you can fish out of there and keep track of, you know, what's going in and out. Mm. So management is not new, but the kind of more recent methods are heavily data driven um, and rely on a lot of like reporting from industry as to how many fish they're taking and a lot of legal <laughs> yes. know, disputes between agencies. You know, it's, it's a lot, but you know, this is not a new concept as it. That is an incredible piece of um, history from a very cultured people. And I'm glad that the Dole Pineapple Company colonized Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah, it's God. so rough. It's really rough history there. Yeah, I do know that in Australia, a bunch of indigenous peoples here had like farming networks of ponds and similar setup, I think, to for, to farm eels and like inland fish. Yeah. So cool. this is like a marine sort of situation, but there are, have been other similar things elsewhere. Totally. Yeah. It's, there's. I think there's a ton of examples. Oh yeah. The world of like like any time between... people saw ah a fig in the water, I could chew on. They will eventually <laughs> yes. work out a way to chew on them yeah. effectively. There are records of, of people keeping track of, for example, like how many salmon are coming upriver this year to spawn versus last year, you know, mm. keeping an eye on that. People who were in tune with the seasonal rhythms of life around them for time and memoriam, but... Um, yeah. So well... We, today we use statistics. <laughs> no! So <laughs> we, we kind of come to the major problem with this effort, which is that C, big, wet, mysterious. Fish, small, wet, mysterious. Difficult to spot small fish in big C to count them. And there's a lot of C. So I want to talk about what we can measure and how those measurements go into estimations of population size. I want to distinguish estimation and measurement here because this is a chance to talk about the different processes involved and the kind of logic which goes into building a model to give you an estimate from measurements. Measurements are the data observed that you put into a model. Despite our best efforts, statisticians aren't omniscient. So along with the actual observations, we need to build our ideas about what we don't know and can't observe or what we think error looks like into the model to get a good estimate out. The general principle is that all models are wrong, but some are useful, and they are more useful if we can understand the ways that they are wrong. The first thing that we're going to look at is called capture, recapture, or mark recapture models. Jesse, could you tell us about how these work? Sure. Okay, so the general principle uh, of uh, mark recapture or capture recapture models is that you're trying to figure out how many total fish are in, let's say for our example, a pond. But you know you can't just one by one probably catch all of them and just count them because that would be insane. Uh, Or at least it would take a very long time. Um, So what you could do is you could catch maybe 10 of those fish. Uh, You could mark them in some way. you could, any, this has been anything from like taking a little fin clip, they call it, where you take a little hole punch out of a fin. Um, I know it sounds painful, but 
you know. Um, you could put tags in the fish. Uh, now there's like radio transmitter tags, ones that pop off at a certain depth and then transmit satellite, satellite data. Huge industry around these weird little probes that people do. But the point is, you've taken out 10 fish. I mean, in, in um, many respects, we are kind of the green aliens that we fear abduct us, right? Like, I think about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we just yank them out, poke them yeah. a bunch, stick holes in them, and stick devices in them, and it's send them back. Well, I think pretty wild. I, I think those science fiction stories emerge at a time when sort of uh, scientific consensus and stuff was being formed, though. So it's almost directly in response to that sort of thing. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's just naturalists just have been exactly yanking fish out of ponds for a very long time. Oh, sure. <laughs> Usually they don't put them back. <laughs> yeah, that's the new the new thing is to uh, so you've got to capture so you've got ten of these fish captured and you mark them in some way. Maybe you tag them with something that can give you some sort of information later. Maybe you just mark them and you chuck them back in. The important thing is that you threw them back in and that they hopefully lived. Um, and then maybe you wait a while or you wait a minute enough time that you think the realistically the fish are probably all mixed around. Um, they're probably all still alive in there. We hope. Uh, they haven't, you know, gone anywhere else. They're probably still just in this pond. Let's catch some more fish. So you take another sample, let's call it, where you catch another 10 fish. And now that the fish have had time to mix with each other in the pond, some of them marked, some of them not marked, you've gone and caught a sample. And some of those that you caught may be marked. So maybe you have two of your new 10 that have been marked. And now you can calculate a cool little proportion here. Mm. Uh, out of this, this which is the number of the tagged fish and then you're kind of dividing by the what is it, the marked oh man they always, always got so if you take oh don't samples, worry we're gonna go into this a little bit more because i okay cool <laughs> you said this to me like multiple went, questions ah. to use. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so okay so we have three things that we can observe how many fish we caught and tagged yeah there's kind of an initial census they call it where you just we took or not, sorry, not census, initial sample. So, survey is probably the term. Yeah, yeah, survey. And then when you take the second sample, you're censusing how many are that you caught are marked. Yeah. So the second thing is how many fish we caught the second time. And lastly, how many of the second catch were tagged. For the most basic model, what we're kind of doing is assuming that the proportion of the second catch that was tagged is approximately equal to the proportion of tagged fish in the general population. Because if the tags are evenly or uniformly distributed, then they'll be uniformly distributed in the sample too. So what we get is that the total tagged, which is this thing, divided by the total population, is approximately equal to the number of tagged on the size of the second catch. So this is going to be... Oh, would there be a sampling bias in the fact that a fish that's been caught before is likely to exhibit behavior that is likely to get them caught again? Oh, we'll talk about that uh, once we talk about the assumptions of this and where you can correct for that sort of great thing. Great question. Yes, it Love, is a good that's question. That's a great question. If we pretend for a second that we know the total population size, let's say that we initially tag 100 fish and uh, from a population of 10,000, then we have a 100 divided by 10,000, which is a 1 on 100 chance of any individual fish that we pull out having a tag. When we go back after some time period and catch, say, 200 fish, we expect to see 1 on 100, which is the each individual fish's chance of fish fish's chance? There's an apostrophe there, anyway. To have a tag on it, so each individual one we pull up, 1 in 100 chance, times the sample size, which is 200. So we expect to see two tagged fish in a sample of 200 with this. Of course, we don't see the true population size, or we wouldn't have to do all of this anyway. So instead, we have to do some algebra. So we're going to rearrange this a bit. First thing we do is we flip both sides. So we wind up with the total population on total tagged, approximately equal to the flip the other side, so second catch on the number of tagged. So once we've got this, we'll then multiply both sides by the total tagged, which will eliminate this thing on the bottom here. So we get the total population is approximately equal to total tagged times second catch divided by tagged. And we know everything on this side of the equation. 
well, up to measurement error anyway. I can imagine if you've got a big catch, you might not count one or two of them, right? So there's some error there. So this is another way of writing this equation down here. It's just instead of having a percentage, I have a fraction because they're equivalent. There's just a factor of 100 involved that I don't want to stuff around with. Yeah, no, it's, that's way cleaner. I love it. With regards to the logic of building a model, right? This is your estimate from the population. This is your data. We have an approximation here. Jesse, what do we know about mark recapture models and the process of data collection, which leads us to think that this won't be equal? And I, I'm leaving aside straight up randomness in the cat. So you'll never see exactly the same proportion unless you're extremely lucky, just because you have a effectively random catch. Yeah, that's a great question. So let's think, let's use a certain case study here just to kind of give an example. Um, let's consider the example of this fish called, have you ever eaten orange roughy, either of you? Are you familiar? No. I, th oh, no, I think I have because I, I'm not, a, I'm not a seafood person. Uh, to mm. my uh, mother is very upset from her Maori heritage. <laughs> that I am not <laughs> an eater right. of seafood. It's not uh, for everyone. Yeah, but my partner is. And I distinctly remember, I think it was Orange Ruffy, that um, his dad made for me at one point to be like, well, if you don't like fish, for whatever reason, here is the least fish-like fish. Oh, man, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love what I'm going to tell you then. Okay, I've had it too. My, it was big in the 2000s. Even um, we imported a lot of it from New Zealand, mm. um, which is... Oh, and Australia. I think you guys did some fishing too, Australia. Uh, but basically, this fish is also known as the slime head. So <laughs> tell maybe they changed the name for some. Because apparently it has like a slimy head, I guess. I don't know. They're kind More of than the hagfish? Fish. Nah, the hagfish is way gnarlier, I think. I think okay. it's, it's when, you when you pull them out of the water, I think they have some mucus going on on their okay. uh, localized in their head, is my guess. Look, um, all of us of, have had sniffles for the last three years, so we can't point fingers. Well, and get this, this fish, it lives on sea mounts, which are kind of, just think of it as little, I mentioned most of the ocean floor is like 5,000 meters-ish deep, 4,000, it's just yeah. a big flat plain. Well, these sea mounts are like little peppered mountains from volcanic activity across that, that are little kind of oases of shallowness, if you will. So these are um, kind of like inverse alpine specialist species. Absolutely, yes. Um, and they're basically, they love these sea mounts. Um, but they're still pretty deep, so they can get up to like a thousand meters down. So this is a deep water fish. They, need, they think they can even deeper than that. But they live also like a hundred and fifty years. Damn. And uh, do you want to guess? Maybe everybody have a guess at when do you think they are uh, become sexually mature and can reproduce? I'm gonna guess like age. ninety ish. <laughs> I'll go three. Just do. <laughs> oh, thanks for. I love that you covered the spread here. Um, <laughs> Hello gang, Tess here. About a week and a half after we recorded this episode, a new paper came out indicating that the uh, New Zealand populations, at least, of the orange ruffy can have a breeding age of about 73. So I'd just like to say that some sort of statistical instinct clearly saved me there, and I heard the best estimate of the two of us. Just so you, just so you know. So it's not quite 90, because I think they would all be, unfortunately, they would all, pro that might be too much for them, but it's mm. like 20 to 27 years old, I yeah. think. Okay, okay. So they're waiting a good amount of time. So they're for waiting it. for marriage. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, but we can consider the fact that, like, okay, if we tried, let's say we're sampling these fish, and we want to do an estimate by mark recapture, right? We're towing a big net across a seamount to do mm. this, because uh, that's how we fish these fish primarily it's a trawl you can drag a big ass net across the top of the seamount you scrape a lot of beautiful uh, thousand year old corals <laughs> i was gonna say that's um, that, isn't that one of the more destructive ways of doing fishing it's it's banned in a lot of places um, yeah i'm not surprised yes yeah, yeah so like in the deep especially deep sea especially like the scars can last like they haven't recovered yet essentially and they did test like i don't know i think it was like 70 years ago or something mm. too there's like scars basically from at least decades and decades um, but the point is, we've now dragged the net across the seamount to grab a bunch of these fish. We marked a bunch. Um, they all came from deep water, and we brought them up and marked them, and they're all dead. It's because they're, shot, they're deep water fish. So that's <laughs> not going to work. So there's, we've run into Sorry, that's problem kind of bleak, one. but it's also, like, such yes. a classic move. Like Yeah. So my point here is that, okay... Not even, let's pretend that even they, they, most of them lived. 
um, and they're totally fine, and we can actually, uh, for the most part, put them back where they belong after we mark them. Even if like a small percentage of them are not surviving, what is probably a pretty traumatic, even for a shallow water catch, yeah, the alien traumatic abduction traumatic experience, yeah. an alien abduction. <laughs> It's a stressful experience. The fish is often disoriented before, during, and after, right? Mm. Which can probably increase your risk for predation, for disease, for general death. Um, so we have some errors built in, right? Like you can't expect to mark and release perfectly all those fish and hope that you're not having any effect on them. Um, Bart, you brought up a, a great similar point earlier in that are we, when we catch these fish the first time, I mentioned in the case of orange roughy, it's a really traumatic trawl experience for a lot of times. But um, even just, you know, dragging a small net through a river, catching the fish the first time might be a pretty also intense experience. Can we anticipate maybe fish do not want to be caught a second time and now having had experience being caught are able to avoid a big net coming through the water or not go for the hook they went for last time? Um, we're dealing with avoidance, basically. And that's going to bias your catches, obviously, because you want everything in your population, your sampling, to be equally likely to fall for the bait, if you will. There's an interesting structure there, because you have like the behavioral avoidance, but there's also a question around, like, is there something that makes your fish more likely to be caught in the first place? Like, right. And, and I think... In my head, size is a really big thing with this, particularly for net-based captures. Yes. So, um, like, what I'm thinking about uh, for the audience is basically that really small fish aren't going to be caught in your net because they'll just swim through the holes, or probably not unless they get really stuck in the tangle of fish or whatever. So you're going to have a biased sample that doesn't reflect the smaller end of the population for whatever population you're looking at. Absolutely right. Um, in the case of fish in those big nets... Um, there's also the other end of the spectrum there is with the really big fish sometimes are able to like outswim the nets essentially. And, like mm. at some point you get these really big fish that, uh, that's not always going to happen of course, but you know, if you have a really big, uh, tuna or something, they can pretty easily evade a net if they can see it coming. Mm. Um, and they yeah, are very just, incentivized just... <laughs> to see that one coming. Yeah, they don't want that. You don't want that to happen. I mean, so you're, yeah, it's a great point of like, did we catch them in the first place because they are, you know, already desperate for food or something and made it, taking risks? And that's that's the thing about you know, there's, there's always going to be assumptions in what you're doing, mm. um, but we're trying to minimize those. And usually, the way that's done is by just catching a lot of fish. Yeah. So other than this, like, once you've got a tag on the fish and you put it back in the environment, what else can happen? to change the likelihood of either that particular fish or that particular tag being found again. Uh, you can imagine the most obvious one is the fish could just get immediately eaten by a shark, right? Is the most like, I guess the interesting <laughs> one to think about is, especially if you put like a like satellite tag on something that's mm. getting pinged and you can see it kind of moving. And then all of a sudden it starts moving the complete opposite direction at a speed that, you know, is shark like. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but you know, it's hard to, tell if maybe like once you're once you release that fish you have no idea mm. you're assuming the tag is sticking to that fish until it is caught again right um and fish fish are always getting removed from the population by you know normal predation not even things that humans are doing it just might get smoked by a bird or something and then there goes your fancy tag mm. but that that's also you're also so you're you're estimating population sizes, but the population size is always a moving target, anyways. Too, like by the time you figure out one estimate, it's probably changed. At least in the life, you know, we're dealing with fishes who generally are spawning huge amounts of fish at a time. Um, when the eggs all hatch, huge rates of mortality, and that's kind of the gambit they're doing. Is like if I make a bunch of eggs, like hundreds of thousands of eggs, and fertilize a lot of them. How can I at least get some larvae to survive and become? Well, yeah, it's a bit like fish. so. I do research on trees, and the I'm not a biologist, so I don't actually have a huge amount of background on tree biology. But it seems to be a very similar sort of strategy: shitloads and shitloads of seeds. But given that forests aren't really growing, or and and particular species communities within forests aren't really growing, what that means is if your mature tree has produced three hundred thousand seeds over the course of its lifespan, 
approximately one of those actually grows to maturity. So, like, the, the, the loss rate of, the, well, the death rate up to that point is massive. Yeah. It, that's generally the pattern you see with fish. It's, there's, like, a huge spectrum within fish of, like, the extreme of that would be, like, tuna, I think, have, like, millions of eggs. Uh, one's broadcast spawning. But generally fish, they are, are selected as the, I don't know if that term, I think we're still using that term. Basically, the, the, the method of, I'm going to make a ton of babies mm. and not really invest much in their survival. But I'm kind of hoping that, you know, of 100,000, 10 of them make it. Whereas or humans even just two of them make it. Right. Humans, you put a ton of investment in just relatively way few offspring. Yeah, yeah. Sharks, weird example of this, because sharks have like, tend to have way fewer offspring and kind of have a live birth situation. But that's a whole different can of beans. Well, it, I mean, does that not vary among sharks too? Because oh, I. Yeah. Okay, right. Because I have heard of shark eggs being yes. a thing that you can find. They have like egg cases that they, they may or may not like release in the sh- I'm not a shark biologist, so I <laughs> yeah, get yeah. some sharks, people mad at me, but <laughs> if, like, they have like an egg, egg case and the case can be birthed in the shark too, in some sharks. Right. Um, and sometimes they eat each other in the egg case, which is messed Ooh. up. <laughs> That's metal as fuck though, let's be I fair. know, right? Yeah. It's really... Grim sharks are grim, yeah. Pretty wild. I mean, yeah. look, most most of nature is grim when you really get down to it. <laughs> not, not us, though. We're, 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 not, no, we're, we're fine. Yeah, cool. we, yeah. we've invented like uh, adorable things. Yes, that's, <laughs> yes. that's all we've done. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, uh, one of the things that you've brought up, like the idea of fish being removed from the population, but also like fish growing up into the population. So this comes to mind with a terminology that came in that figure before of what a closed population model is. So what is an open population model as opposed to a closed population model? Yeah, so this is one of, a, like, if we go back to the example of our pond from earlier, um, that would be a closed population in that you can be pretty sure that there are not new fish coming in from, you know, the neighbor's pond into your pond, because that would be pretty wild. Um, I guess technically possible with some flood or something, but basically, if there's not a you know good chance of influx, mm. you got a close population. Contrast this to like you know the Mississippi Delta, big river. It's connected to the entire ocean and also the entire river above it. But then you're trying to say how many fish live in this you know hundred yard sector of the Mississippi Delta? Well, you're dealing with you know probably a lot of transient populations. And depending on what species you're looking at, and it's going to be a much different situation considering ins and outs and traffic. Okay, so a closed population is not just no new fish, it's no exits from the population either. Right. Okay. So, Or at least not like, you know, you, you want to be able to take account of, you know... You, you could say that if the fish are dying, I guess, it's still a yeah, well, this population, is... but you yeah, got to yeah. know. Yeah, so one of the... Um, things that i have seen get used as like kind of one step up in complexity from a capture recapture model is that you incorporate a model of like births and deaths basically Mm -hmm. because births will increase the number of untagged fish deaths will if your tagged fish die decrease the number of tagged fish so you wind up with a smaller proportion of your overall population being tagged than it would look like from what you started at right so that's kind of a, a, an open population model you don't you can have like migrations into your area which is part of how your open population has influx or migrations out of your area which is how it has like outflux i guess or output perhaps i don't know what the terminology is there what other sorts of like additional structure can you put into this to account for that sort of thing i, th- I was just looking at um just like right before this, actually, I was looking at some some more recent like add-ons, basically. To I was reading like basically there were some early models of this that run with uh, some clunky programs that I don't think will run on my computer anymore. But then there's like some updates they put in, and it had a really great list of like things you can add to a model like this to make it more interesting. And so I found a few here. This is from uh, looks like a course from WLF, basically. But here here's some nice additions here so you can add some heterogeneity um basically you can this is assuming that each organism each fish has the equal probability of being caught 
um, but you could alter this based on you can incorporate some amount of fish are more likely to be caught period mm. around these little islands let's say and you can kind of have this uh, heterogeneity uh, of habitat or of topography basically uh, that somehow to account for like fish are more likely to be in these areas period and therefore if we are sampling you know, in sectors two and three of this big thing that are by all these nice kelp forests and a bunch of cover uh, that there are target fish loves to hang out in. Maybe that is not as representative as if we were to sample, you know, 100 yards in the other mm. direction where it's just this open sand flat or something. So something to think about is like when you're actually doing the sampling, um, are you sampling, you know, uniformly? Uniformly is great, yes. Yeah, well, um, sample survey structure is a whole field of statistics, yeah. and it is so complex once you get to that level. Yeah, um, and think even, in just apply that, everything I just said, but instead of heterogeneity in space, it's more like in time where fish are mm-hmm. moving, and they can have seasonal migrations. So any, anything you can picture varying with space um, is something to think about, right? Because yeah. if all of the fish are gone because they're migrating in the fall from your little area and you do your whole experiment then, then you can be totally off mm. relative to you had you done it some other time. Uh, so you're dealing with, you're, tr- you're catching these little snapshots of a population, uh, but you know, the more you, the more you sample, the better it is, but uh, it gets tough, especially um, something else to think about is when these fish, <laughs> some of the data of, uh, the tags being recaptured is from, or a lot of it is from fishermen themselves, like reporting, hey, we caught, you know. They yank something onto the background. Oh, yeah, the biologists will be doing this. Yeah. So you know those fish are dead now. Mm. So you know they're tagged, but they're also dead, which is like an interesting, you have to be thinking of the traffic flow of, not a crude way to put it, but like of the Mm. life and deaths of these fish while you're trying to like seasonally figure out, you know, what's going on with their populations. And then suddenly you have an algae bloom that kills like 100,000 fish or something. Yeah. <laughs> there have been a couple of cases of that uh, in Australia, actually. Oh, no. Is it red tide or whatever? Well, no, no. This is um, inland rather than marine, as far as I know. This oh. problem, look, we've got huge coral bleaching problems in the Great Barrier Reef, oh. which is not so great as it was 20 years ago. And basically <laughs> visit that while you can, uh, if yeah. you're into... Oh, coral. no, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, we're But gonna, inland we've had a I'm couple sure we're of... we're going to save ourselves from climate change, right? <laughs> Let's turn this car around. <laughs> yeah, sure. But uh, with the, with the inland stuff, you've got like rivers, the Murray Darling River in particular, which is a large river system in the eastern part of Australia, so around New South Wales and Victoria, sort of thing, has um, huge amounts of water being taken out of it to irrigate crops. Uh, should we be growing cotton, one of the most water intensive uh, crops? Oh, no. In, a, in the world, in Australia, in an arid environment that requires this agriculture, I don't think Probably so. not rice either. But one the of the things... As, a, <laughs> as uh, you, someone you can, from the area. You can, do gro- you can do rice. You can do rice without rice paddies. That's basically a form of weed oh. control. Yeah. You I don't actually that. need that. It's just used because the rice can tolerate the water while most of the weeds can't. Oh. Yeah. It's really cool, huh? But uh, cotton's really, really bad. But you have huge amounts of this water being taken out of the system and huge sections of the the river system are now starved for water or perhaps dehydrated would be the better term there and you see like a lot of fish basically getting stuck in stagnant water ponds that are too small for them and don't have inflows of water or outflows because there's not enough water in the system this was more of an issue a couple of years ago because it was like a decade-long drought uh but we had like multiple instances of huge fish die-off and all the resulting problems of having huge fish die-off, like decaying fish in your water system, that was really quite horrific and devastating for a lot of communities around the area too. I mean, you can imagine it's like, okay, we also have the loss of all these fish, that's bad. And then they have to rot there hugely, which is also yep. going to create an incredibly toxic water quality situation. Yes. Uh, not even to mention the smell for the... <laughs> Yeah, in the town, I guess. I don't. Good lord, I can't even imagine what the smell like. Well, I'm sure you'll have the opportunity <laughs> to find out sometime. Yeah, I mean that's the story of a lot of rivers in America as well. It's like mm. migration patterns being closed off due to either dams or um, it's usually dams. Or I was going to say it doesn't. Flows. Isn't the Colorado River system one of those now? 
Oh, I'm not sure about Colorado. I know there's, I, I mostly look at dams on the Sacramento and some other California rivers, and there's a ton there, but. Um, yeah. Do you mean Colorado's getting the new one? No, I, I mean, like, the, I think it's the Colorado River, the one that goes near Las Vegas. Oh, are they do? They've got the Hoover Dam there. Hoover Dam, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. The reason I'm thinking about Classic. this is that uh, my partner and I went to a friend's 50th birthday in Las Vegas in early 2020. We managed to get back just about a few weeks before the border closed. Very lucky. Oh my God. But I know, right? But, like, that dam is drying up. Oh, it's yes, get, that's yeah, right. yeah, it's getting to the right. point where there's uh, not enough water there to potentially generate enough power for Las Vegas, which is going to be interesting. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course, like as far as I know, the Colorado River there doesn't reach the sea anymore. So all of those downstream areas, which previously relied on the water coming through, wetlands, whatever else, just don't exist. I'd also like right. to point out that in both it's, America and yeah. Australia, um, irrigation rights have been taught turned into a commodifiable asset oh god it's so bad and so yeah yeah look into yasher <laughs> levine's reporting i think he mostly called it oligarch valley oh, when no. it comes to potassio uh <laughs> oh, production in uh, california mm. well over here there's a, a bit of a kerfuffle at the moment because there's been some i won't be defamatory and call it corruption but shall we say some Stuff that potentially would not pass a sniff test relating to water rights in Western New South Wales and uh -oh. government ministers. That's... I, somehow I'm not shocked, but... Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> ugh, God, that's a story of... You know, there's a million stories like that in yeah. my country as well, so I can't... Uh, <laughs> well, no, and they're all shit person. everywhere, right? Like, yeah, it's brutal. It's not about throwing shade, it's about <laughs> saying it's all bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah good point. Well said, well said. Yeah, yeah. So this model that we've talked about with capture recapture is fairly intuitive. Uh, we've seen how you can add some complexity to it. What other models are there? So this is interesting, actually. When I first got into like, well, oceanography, I guess, in, in thinking about fish more than just like as uh, things to eat or like you know, going to the aquarium. A lot of people are surprised to realize I did not always want to be a fish biologist growing up. Uh, this mm. is a tangent, but you know, I, I, you never appreciate look. something until you really have <laughs> to think about it hard. You know, I mean, I look, know. I got distracted by trees after doing quantum mechanics. I'm not pointing any fingers. Yes, see, you get it. Um, but okay, so the point is, I was I was interested. Like, to, this is kind of where I was coming from. I was trying to read about how. Um, you know, fisheries measure this stuff. And I was surprised that a lot of the older papers use this, or the end, some of the more modern ones use catch per unit effort as the model. Um, you can kind of guess what that means, but basically, essentially it's saying you're trying to quantify how much, you know, let's say man hours you're committing to fishing a given area and then quantifying how many you catch from that sort of effort. And that's your metric of... Mm you know, how many fish are there? Because <laughs> it took us nine hours to catch 15 today, but, you know, uh, two years, maybe it takes us 20 hours to catch even just two. Mm. Um, and it, this is a lot, this is kind of a much messier number, as you can probably guess, uh, especially because, you know, like effort of what, like of in a giant industrial fishing net is going to be different than effort of yeah. uh, your grandfather's dinghy. Um, so there's there's methods to like standardize that, of course, but still you're dealing with like a bunch of different. It's very heterogeneous, like, let's say. Yes, yes, and you primarily are going to see, during your that most of the like utility of using this as a metric is when you're dealing with massive populations of fish, which makes sense on an industrial scale, and also when they're like changing by more than fifty percent, yeah. <laughs> which is you yeah. know, either you're doing a big boom and bust cycle with sort of fishery. Um, or you have a specific species that is like, has a very drastic, uh, you know, we have a bunch of kids right now and then all of us die sort of lifestyle, which is yeah. kind of how salmon work, but not quite that drastic at all. Um, mm. so you can kind of tell that this, this is a metric that came a large part out of industry is my impression. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, this is asking what data do we have available? Well, we have metrics on fish catch, and we know how long they were out to sea or whatever. Exactly. You don't really know where. I mean, you may, you, depending on the you know, organization, the management, the fish company, you may have better or worse data on this, right? Like, mm. there's worse reporting. Uh, you know, these days, it's pretty strict. And, you know, NOAA in America is, has observers on fish boats, and 
has pretty strict regulations for how much cash you can take. Um, but still, you know, people reporting data is always going to be a bit squishy. It's tough. Mm-hmm. It's a tough thing to keep track of, even yeah. you know, with applying malice. But people, what's t- keeping track of gigantic numbers of populations in gigantic industries? Well, I mean, even measuring right. how many fish you pull up in a catch is hard. Right. You have to measure all. I will say that was the funniest thing about that show, um, Deadliest Catch, is that the two complaints that they had every year is that they had to go further and further out to catch uh, the crabs and that there were more and more government regulations on how many crabs they could catch. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They're like, it's harder to catch these crabs. Also... Why can't we take more of them? I mean, look, I don't necessarily blame people for their ignorance in this sort of thing. I do think no. that particularly, shall we say, people who wind up on that kind of fishing boat probably haven't had access to the kind of education where you would get taught about relationships between those things. Oh, no, there's no... Yeah, there's, for real. Yeah. What I found particularly, like, ironic, and in, I don't know that one or, or a related one or, or a news story about, like, people, uh, well, fishers, Fishermen and fisherwomen, I suppose. Fisher people. Uh, I don't know if we were okay with fisher folk. I always like that one. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> fish <laughs> folk is a very different thing. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, these people who work in the fishing industry and are losing their livelihoods, particularly like commercial fish, uh, fishers in like Western countries as opposed to subsistence fishers, and they're basically saying like, oh, this is our identity. We, we have to keep doing this because it's our identity. And I find that particularly complex because yes there is clearly something going on like with these people where they feel like they have a real connection to this industry for right or wrong or whatever and they so there there is a loss to them if it goes away but they there is also seeming resistance to reshape it into something that is in any way sustainable and absolutely i, I mean looking at things like the the hawaiian example with these like little local subsistence fishes fisheries and also um i know that some indigenous organizations in australia are looking at basically reinstating methods of fishing which were much more sustainable because in some respects they couldn't be more intensive because the technology didn't exist but may be able to like sustain a local community and also have some surplus which can be sold for profit so exactly. maybe there's space for that. It's I think it's a classic tale of in history we see like indigenous people in the U.S. as well that in, uh, they have very strong cultural and reli- often religious ties to specific ancestral fishing grounds, um, and it is of course those people that are pushed to the margins by like industrial fishing. Interests, yeah, right. Sure. I mean, I, even like we I think a lot of fishermen probably. You know, we, we think of like the rank and file fisherman uh, who doesn't want more regulation. Sure, that exists. But there's also like I think those the people, people who exist own also, huge commercial exactly, trawlers are a very those different are class. the people that believe that also and also have not you know been blue collar in their life or whatever. Maybe yeah. they have, but the point is they are not they are people of means, and uh, those are the people who are like, fight against regulation. Of course, now it ends up as like, well. We can we have to carve space as well for people to you know fulfill their cultures. Um, I totally understand that, and I, it is complex though because it's like you know there's whale hunting that people it's, it's a touchy subject. Um, mm. But I would you know of course all of you we can definitely focus the ire and the pressure on industry rather than indigenous folks, and even yeah. in just in terms of scale, like come yeah. on, it's a drop in the bucket, man. Like compared to what. Most, if you look at an industrial fleet of fishing boats, is kind of terrifying, just in terms of scale. And also, like the the specific mechanisms of fishing as well. Like you talked about earlier about the damage that trawling does, yes. and that really is something that needs to end if these places are going to be able to regenerate and support the very things that the trawling is trying to catch. Yeah, and I think the important thing to preserve is um, in in indigenous groups, it's like this really strong connection to the animal um mm. and we you know it, people in america uh, have been fishing for a long time well before the british colonized this place um, and they have a, there's there's reverence there for like the salmon for example in a lot of cultures and mythologies uh and, and i think that I think there's also to, a recognition cool. of codependence 
Like yes, it's not it's precisely. it's a very different relationship to have to see a an ecosystem as something you are dependent on and need to have it be healthy as opposed to like seeing um an ecosystem as something there for you to exploit and capitalize on. And I do think that like you don't have to be indigenous to have that. I mean, I think a lot of people sure. doing like ecological research or even even a lot of farmers understand having a relationship to the land and having stewardship over it as opposed to ownership over it. But it requires a, a kind of radical and broad scale shift outside of the capitalist framework for yes. production to have that on a big enough scale to make it sustainable. It's in industrial extraction. I was just going to say the other part about that is that blue collar fishermen that you used as an example before might have reactionary views on this stuff. Because they know that uh, in our capitalist system, when the main industry in a town goes away, that hasn't worked out for the people who live there. <laughs> and who starve, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and this is, like, it's, it's similar, I think, for people um, who have, like, been coal mining for generations, as opposed to people who have gone into coal mining, like, because it's the most profitable job in an area. But certainly there are people looking at these changes to combat things like biodiversity loss and climate change and going, how the fuck am I going to eat? This is why ideas of justice in changes around that sort of thing and like community, co I mean, community consultation sounds so like trite, right? But community involvement and community agency in decision making and in finding new ways to support themselves. Because otherwise, well, if they continue as they're going, the fish will die because they, they'll be fished to death. If they completely remove all the fishing, the people won't have something to eat. So there's there's got to be somewhere in middle ground. We're on the left. I've got get better when we talk about environmental things in talking about what we can replace it with and talking about state production and state state run industries that will keep these communities alive. Mm. Uh, Jesse, were there any Ooh. other models that you wanted to talk about? Oh, there's also here's a fun one stats wise. Okay. Uh, you can also take. If, well, like length frequency analysis is a fun thing to think about. Um, so let's say you, you capture like 100 fish and you measure all of the, their lengths. And you can take their mass too if you want, whatever you want to do. Um, but you can imagine you'll get some kind of distribution of length, right? Mm. Um, any guesses on what that distribution might look like? I'm going to draw it. Yes. Roughly that uh, may maybe like more hump shaped. So, because you probably won't catch anything below a particular size, something like that, maybe? <laughs> you nailed it. You nailed okay. it. Love it. Yes. I was going to be like, oh, the small one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is all just going to depend on your net mesh size, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, in my head, right, black line is like population structure, and blue line is your catch structure. Yeah, there you go. And you can kind of morph those to, or the catch structure by what kind of gear you're using. My gear, yeah. Sorry, my, I should have defined gear, but I'm, I'm meaning like, Fish nets. What are whatever. you fishing with? Yeah, a long line, fishing pole, fishing net. And so are, is your is your sampling method able to reflect the size distribution you see in nature? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but an interesting thing to do every year is if you like keep sampling this, and then uh, every year you can kind of see cohorts, as you call mm -hmm. them, is like, oh, these are the... So there's a bunch of different terms that exist in like probably every language for like various... <laughs> tiny like ages of fish there's like fingerlings yeah <laughs> young of, young of the year is another one uh, like fry is a fun one it's, it's basically but the point is like there's all these different little age groups that you can isolate you're basically taking fish demographics yeah you're doing this um and if you really want to know more you can figure out how old the fish are individually yeah, that Just was actually something that I wanted to it. ask about because yes. when you going all the way back to the orange ruffy discussion how did they tell the age of the orange ruffy? Well, this is a great story. Um, okay, so the traditional method of aging, called aging fish, is figuring out basically how old uh, fish is. Um, people have been doing this for a while, uh, which is taking a hard part of an animal, let's say like a sp uh, spine or, uh, or your vertebrae or something, and you're taking like a big section of it, like you're mm. slicing a really thin slice of it um, across maybe midways or something, and similar to tree rings, oftentimes you can count 
growth rate. Why striation is yeah, caused by changes in growth rate okay. um, if there's a, some kind of seasonal cycle. Yeah, well, one of the one of the things I do in my research is deal with trees that don't have regular growth rings. Same so. idea. Oh, that's, see, your trees have a lot of similar yeah, groups yeah, of yeah. fish. It, it turns uh, out physiology of growth <laughs> kind of similar across all kinds yeah. of different taxa, huh? It's really interesting shared stuff. It's been our, in most case of most fishes, uh, you're going to want to use the ear bone, the otolith. It's called O-T-O-L-I-T-H. It's like, it looks like a P. Okay. Almost. Tiny little ear bone, usually can be kind of flat that you take a band saw and you really really narrowly slice one of those uh and then you look at it under a microscope mm. and you count the rings okay. and you hope that you're seeing enough annual uh rings variation to in yeah because like uh for the people who aren't aware what what causes tree rings is that you need enough variation in growth rate to have something where it is a slow growth rate region which looks like a a, a ring of more solid wood and an area of faster growth, which is more like spaced out wood areas. So I imagine it's kind of similar in fish, where you have denser areas of the slower growth. Exactly the same principle. It's just with bone material instead of wood. Okay. Exactly the same thing. Um, and you can verify this these days with radiocarbon dating. Um, really? Because that, that's interesting, because I didn't think that radiocarbon dating had a short enough half-life to be usable for that. Or you could do, what is what is this paper I was reading? It was using thorium two something something? Let's see, I'm just saying carbon dating because I was just thinking about Yeah, carbon yeah, dating. it's what people have as a it's, reference, uh, yeah, yeah. I think he was using thorium, this guy. Uh, okay, so it's probably something with a shorter half-life than five and yes, a half thousand years, basically. Yes, but you, okay. basically you, you have to radiometrically verify yeah. that it's, uh, if you want to be like double mega sure, that the growth rings are annual because usually they're caused by seasonal pulses in food. Um, right. But if you're worried, if your environment your fish lives in is, doesn't have really strong seasonal effects, it might be a little more difficult to resolve any rings. Um, the tale with Orange Ruffy is if you just read that, um, if you look at the rings in that little otolith bef- and you don't slice it at all, if you just like look at it through a magnifying glass, uh, people used to generally think that was good enough to count the rings. And right. I thought it maybe like <laughs> seven years maximum or something. <laughs> and, mm. and then guess what? We fished a lot of them, a lot of them, um, in, especially around New Zealand, crashed their population really hard, especially in the, I think, 90s and 2000s. And people eventually started saying, whoa, 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 stop. These fish are 150 years old sometimes. Yeah, so uh, one so of the important things that comes into play there is that if you have a fish that lives a long time, then it may not replenish its population fast enough, or it doesn't, in this case, replenish its population fast enough to deal with the disruption of overfishing. And, like, this is... um, I think tuna is also kind of has this issue, because to get to the size of a really big tuna, you have to live for a long enough time to do that, and it takes a while. Is this what causes the tipping point effect with these species? It can definitely trigger, like, kind of a, like... I guess like uh, you kind of like if you wipe out enough sexually mature adults, yeah, you can like basically crash the population because uh, you know I mentioned before if they spawn and you know one fish that spawns may have plenty of eggs, they all get fertilized and turn into a new fish. Let's say even if they don't get eaten, it still is going to take like twenty years for that particular offspring to reproduce. So you have a twenty year lag in replenishment uh, once you you know. Like yeah, the fish reproduces once, which is yeah, and and in that twenty year time span, if you because you don't have sexually mature adults, you won't get new, well, eggs, fingerlings, whatever right. else coming through. So you'll have kind of one last boom generation, and then a real bottleneck, and so and that's why you get that kind of twenty year lag effect. Yeah, it's especially with orange ruffy. It's like this boom and bust cycle. They say because as this was happening. Fishers would deplete a few sea mounts, move on to the next one, deplete that one, move on to the next one. Right. So yeah. you're like kind of like dominoes, and then yeah, each and of the there's no time to recover. recover. Yeah, they're not coming back for. I mean, just I think we're just now seeing. I think New Zealand has has done a lot better management recently on this, and they're just now seeing some recovery from the fishery mm. in the two early two thousands and nineties. I think uh, because it's like yeah. it's almost they're twenty years later, thirty years later. I guess it's hardening that we caught it in time question mark 
It's like, still I a mean, species, man. It's still alive. You know, yeah, there's still well, fisheries I, for it that are, quote, sustainably caught. So you can still somehow eat some orange rocky if you want to. Uh, I, I mean, apparently, if I remember correctly, I have. <laughs> I have no idea if it was sustainably it's fished. Fine. Though, so. I bet it, unfortunately, I bet it wasn't in the 2000s, so I'm sorry. But I uh, did too, we, this we wouldn't be like... The consumer like didn't really know, though. 2014, hopeful, maybe. Oh, actually, okay, that might have been okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might have been okay. <laughs> I it's like not, fish, fine. but I've it's never kind of a it, so fish, to be maybe I should get out mm. and uh, find some. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a mailbag segment where people send in statistics that they want to hear more about or more often want me to get angry over. This week, we're looking at a news story about a report from the US government on living conditions over there, if you will. Well, you are, Jesse. It's great. Uh, this one comes from Yahoo Finance. A record 68% of American households said their savings could cover a $400 emergency in 2021. This data comes from the Federal Reserve Survey, Economic Wellbeing of U.S. Households, which is referenced in the show notes if you want to go and have a look at that. This is a very positive spin on the actual statistic. So let's unpack it. First off, if 68% of your households can cover a $400 emergency, that means 100 minus 68, which is 32%, can't. So a third of households in America don't have $400 to hand. And realistically, $400 is not a very expensive emergency in the land of multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars in <laughs> medical debt. There's other things going on here as well. That this is a record number a record high, I should clarify, is interesting because the survey asking that question only has data going back to 2013. So for example, there's no pre-2008 financial crash data. No data from the time before worker productivity was disconnected from profits thanks to Reaganomics. This means that the claim, which appears to imply that actually people are doing better than ever before, is probably not reflective of lived experience very much. This is also at least partly attributed to the meager amount of money that the US government gave to people during COVID. So those small number of lump sums, small as they were, they probably gave a bunch of households a bit of a buffer that they hadn't had previously. It probably didn't last very long, but it existed potentially for some of these households for long enough to show up in this survey. There's another factor here, which this article doesn't mention at all, I'm not surprised, sampling bias. So the household part of this, the household survey, is, as the name suggests, based on houses. Participants are selected from a record of home addresses, which means that if you have lost your home because you can't afford to stay in it, you won't show up in the participants list, so you won't show up in this survey. This is a bit of an issue when you have spiralling housing costs and an increased population of unhoused people as America does at the moment. Your statistics around improving material conditions may well be biased towards looking like things are going better, precisely because so many people are in such desperate poverty that they drop out of your survey altogether. This made me very angry. I'm not surprised by it, because, I mean, Fortune at Yahoo Finance is <laughs> um, encouraged to posit that the material conditions of everyday Americans are better than they actually are. I'm trying to think of what a $400 emergency would be. Wait, can I just say the sentence again so I can... A record 68% of American households said their savings could cover a $400 emergency in 2021. Yeah. Famously, nothing happened in 2021 either. Yeah. yeah, right. So uh, I'm thinking like um, something goes wrong in your car, which is not like major right. repairs. That's like, like my parking <laughs> brake is being weird in my car. Yeah. That's the level of emergency <laughs> I'm able to mitigate with my $400. Yeah, or maybe you, you, you have a problem that requires you to go to a doctor once and a medication yes. isn't too pricey and you don't miss any shifts at work. For real. They, he asked me three questions and this <laughs> consultation costs three ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> but God, like that's... this is Yeah, and, and the fact that a third of households couldn't even cover that, pretty fucking desperate, really. So the record is referring, you're right, it's referring to, this is a positive record. A record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheet record high, high. 68. Brutal. But yeah, you're right, 32. <laughs> yeah. That is well, I, pretty I, incredible. Yeah. Well, I haven't um, 
looked too deep into the actual the actual Federal Reserve report because I suspect that in that report they say something about the sampling bias because mm. you know at that level of government you have to think about sampling bias. Oh sure. But this kind of like this kind of reporting has no idea what that would even no. mean and certainly isn't going to represent it to the public. I'm sure it's in a gigantic <laughs> PDF report the government made in there. Yeah. Like, sure, that's awesome. Some very detailed <laughs> statistician was like, oh, let's think about the standard last Awesome. Love it. Yahoo yeah. Fortune, apparently not as committed to the facts. Good God, man. <laughs> yeah, it's real depressing. But this is a positive headline, right? I feel better. God, I'd hate to. I'd hate to live in a country where like all the news you get is like propaganda and trying to support your institution. Oh, yeah, imagine really, really <laughs> that, would, that would actually suck really bad. So, Seeing commercials for medicine is always fun here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's something really weird. Like in Australia, about the most sort of medication that you'll see advertised is over the counter stuff in a supermarket. So you might see Nurofen or paracetamol or something. Prescription medications, I don't think you're legally allowed to advertise for. That rules. That's hilarious. You're not yeah. told every day to ask your doctor about like <laughs> Skyrizy or whatever. I don't know what's going. Sorry if you take Skyrizy. <laughs> is your anus falling out pretty. every time? <laughs> it's like it's, we watch a lot of like terrible television that just has ads that are for. Oh, like American the advertising is so weird. Yeah, it's bizarre. Like, to, I, I have to admit that I did not perhaps embrace the opportunity to expose myself to very much of it when I was <laughs> over there. But what I did see oh, what are you was... talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, so uh, I was over there when there was a whole bunch of like oh early advertising for the 2020 election. Oh, my gosh. I know. So, And, and this was like February 2022. So it wasn't all the really oh, cooked stuff that came out during COVID. I'm pretty sure I saw Bloomberg ads in Nevada. You will see every permutation of fucked up ad ever you could ever your mind could even dream of you will see it on american <laughs> television at 2 p.m between like two episodes of bridezilla's or whatever it's <laughs> d- truly deranged <laughs> shit on there man see i think um i think our equivalent of the uh, bloomberg ad in uh, nevada is the walking down any street in australia and seeing a clive palmer billboard Wait, who, oh my who is God. this can you give me an australian no. it's like a <laughs> psycho billionaire Who's now like a anti-vax guy? Oh. Yeah, so oh, cool. uh, Clive, Clive Palmer made his money in mining, as most Australian billionaires did. He then decided that he would start a political party, basically to advance his interests in politics. Uh, cool. So he is like he's very much kind of a free market capitalist guy, but has gone hard in on like vaccine conspiracy theories and things in order to get votes. Um. Uh, so he, with his billions of dollars ran a candidate in every seat in the Australian election that has happened. Oh. It's not clear how much money he spent on this effort because he did bankroll all of them and all the advertising and all that sort of thing. He didn't win any seats, thankfully, uh, but Jesus. I'm not entirely sure that winning seats was the goal. He is, in the truest Australian, a cooked unit. <laughs> That's like an Austin Powers villain. That's wild. Because <laughs> I'm also, also reading... Just... Do you, yeah. are, have you been on his Wikipedia article about the Titanic 2? Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember this. He also wanted tell? to start a Jurassic Park at some stage. <laughs> uh, I'm quoting well, just stick from... Stick Gina Reinhardt in a cage and let her eat oh children. Oh my god, yeah. he literally did. He was trying to build a Jurassic Park. But he also announced at a press conference plans to build a modern-day replica of the liner of the Titanic. It was planned that Titanic 2, for, probably shouldn't name it that, would be built in China and make its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City in 2016, postponed later to 2018. Did that happen? I don't, I don't think know if this happened. I think we would have heard of it if it happened. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, they, okay, they, okay they, you they say that, it. but it's been four years since that and the COVID pandemic happened. And fuck knows how much we actually remember of 2018. <laughs> Wait, here, here's your recent update. You ready? On September 27th, 2018, 2018 in a press release on its website, the uh, company involved announced that work would uh, recommence, but there is no confirmation of that since. And uh, despite this release of the press release, their website has not been updated since May 2014. <laughs> oh my God, so that's amazing. I think okay. you might be waiting a while before you see the Titanic 2 in your waters. Well, look, all they have to do now is just kind of, like, adopt one of those abandoned cruise liners, and they can do it with that. Slap Titanic 2 on the side, it'll be fine. Are you guys not doing cruises again? We're back to cruises every year. We're going on cruises again, everyone. There are cruises again, I know, because I see uh, 
people boomers on their way to the earth to the uh, ports yeah, on the train they're occasionally ready. they're ready to go yeah but certainly i think the cruise industry as a whole has taken a hit thank fuck <laughs> but like <laughs> <For real. laughs> oh my god it's such Ooh. a deeply cursed thing it's truly direct like just the worst <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't wait to hear about how uh monkey pox has been spread across another few countries by a cruise ship Lord. We can recreate early 2020. It'll be great. <laughs> they make you go to dinner with other, like, they make you sit at the table with, like, different families, which just sounds nice, but, like, is weird. I, I've been on a cruise when I was a kid. It was weird. Yeah, do they still do that, though? Because I, I that don't know. The industry's <laughs> changed a lot. I, I honestly believe that. I would hope you're not <laughs> sitting with random strangers these days. I mean, I mean look, I, I'm willing to bet money that at least one cruise will do that oh, for some will. classes of people. <laughs> It's not for me. Well, no, I mean, you don't want to be able to peer down and go, oh, look at all the fish we're fucking up with this huge ship. Yeah, I can't wait to see how many whales are screaming in terror from this <laughs> large honking thing. Also, just wander around and see how many uh, Filipino guys we're uh, exploiting with this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, the, we, have, we have a weird... Well, I think you guys have a lot of problems with the, the, the basically, like, off books employing of a lot of people or something. On those ships, or in fishing vessels as well. It's very strange. Oh, we, we are the ones where, well, we're not where the capitalists base their businesses because we're not that much of a tax agent, but we're, they're where the capitalists live. So oh, okay. they live here and then they like take people and, uh, shall we say, talk firmly to them, not defo, uh, in order to keep them on various fishing vessels and cruise ships oh, and whatever else. Ah, I think I was reading a story about that. That's what I'm thinking of. And that was terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out press gangs have different mechanisms now. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is an episode. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's a great time. Lovely to talk some stats. Yeah, where can people find you? Oh, let's see. I am on Twitter at uh, Jesse Black Sci, as in science. So it's J E S S E, black like the color, and then S C I. I mostly just retweet like the pictures of like manatees and fish and stuff, doing silly things, nice. or whatever. Oh, yeah. uh, but it's whatever. Yeah, it passes the time, you know. And I occasionally retweet the, the odd scientific article about fish there. If you want to, for me to get very, very angry at a statistic you see in the news, send it to us on Twitter or via email addresses and things in the notes because I'm not reading those out all over again. I can never remember where the different cutoffs of words are. Uh, we also have a Patreon, which I keep forgetting to plug. Give us money. I do a lot of work <laughs> on this and I, I need coffee to do that work. So. I second that. Give them money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fuel my coffee habit. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you both so much for coming on, and I'll talk to you later, Bart. Yeah, speak to you then.